genuineness and genius. And that's why mathematics is the mother science and the mathematicians are regarded in the highest esteem in academia. Being trained as a physicist, I understand that physics would stand nowhere unless mathematicians were there. So we owe our, our discipline a great deal to the journey made by our co-journey maker, the mathematicians. To just mention a bit of information about the School of Basic Sciences at the Manipal University, Jaipur, we started our journey only nine years back in 2011. So we are nine years old now and we are already a NAC A plus grade uh, accredited university at the Manipal University, Jaipur. We are also the best university of Rajasthan as honored by the Institution of Engineers, which is a very, very old academic and technological institution of India. Having said that, I also like to inform you that we have five departments, the Department of Physics, Department of Chemistry, Department of Biosciences, Department of Mathematics and Statistics, and the Department of Computer Applications. Now, altogether, we have close to 70 faculty members, a few hundred students, and also about 200 research scholars. Our cumulative number of publications is close to 500 now. We have more than four crores of or 400 lakhs of Indian rupees in terms of funding. We also have many startups formatted by and forwarded by, supported by, encouraged by our faculty members, particularly Director Professor Larita Lirwani herself from the Department of Chemistry has a startup. Also, Professor Mosubi Devnath from the Department of Biosciences has also enrolled in a startup. So we are not only doing education, we are not only teaching uh, the students, we are also showing ourselves joining a startup people that how to utilize education in a more direct manner of social entrepreneurship. In other words, also we have MOU with more than 100 universities globally and we would be very interested to extend the same with the University of Austria, Ostrava and also the uh, NIT Calicut if, if we are permitted and if we are supported there by the respective professors. We should also mention that we have deep connect with several varieties of industry, not only material science industry, but also computer industry and pharmaceuticals industry. Also, we are connected deeply with many national laboratories to which our students go for internship. So we are very well connected that way. <coughs> and here we also take care of the students in terms of developing their social commitment. As human beings, we are social creatures and we must take into account the distress of our fellow people in society. So we always make sure that we have, you know, School Connect and People Connect program at the School of Basic Sciences so that our students can get a touch of real life feeling about how the other people's lives are and what they can contribute in real terms, in terms of knowledge, in terms of you know, sanitation program in terms of giving them education about basic computer skills, health hygiene, so on and so forth. So basically our school strives to pick up a student and to make him or her a complete young person when he or she goes out of the university, not only in terms of knowledge, not only in terms of application, but also in terms of character building and compassionateness, which we all believe here is very important to grow as a socially responsible person. And in particular, in these COVID times, we need to be sensitive to our all fellow people in the society, their distress, their agonies, and we should support them to the extent as possible under the norms of social distancing. I'm also very grateful to the university authority for letting us, allow, allowing us to use this platform to connect this bridge with the academia abroad, not only the invited speakers themselves, but also in general, all the academia abroad we have joined today and many of us are joining <clears throat> and will be joining in the days to come. I'm also very grateful to the organizers here for giving me this brief opportunity to share my thoughts and views with you. I wish the webinar uh, the great success. I once again thank Professor Irina and Professor Jacob. I once again congratulate all the participants in this international online five-day workshop. I also congratulate all the organizers, particularly Dr. Kalpana Sharma, the head, Dr. Mahesh Dubey and all the team members, Dr. Rishi Kizdatta Thiyari and all others, Dr. Vivek Singh and others. And I believe that there will be a great amount of takeaway 
from this successful uh, conduction of this uh, workshop and people will enjoy the sharing of knowledge views and information thank you so much i will conclude here and also look forward to have the very nice conduction of this workshop in a very successful manner thank you that's all from my side thanks a lot sir for your kind words and time we are now we are honored to have with us our special chief guest professor irina perkilwa from the university of ostrava czech republic so i request professor perkilwa to kindly address the gathering madam please Hello to everybody. Do you hear me? I hope that yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. You are audible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so once again, hello to everybody, and uh, I'm very happy to be with you this day in particular and in general during this um, workshop. Uh, I'm happy that I've got and accepted the invitation from the uh, Manipal University to deliver my knowledge regarding some modern branches of science. And I'm happy that the interest uh, to this type of science, I mean, uh, these sciences on the border between computer science and mathematics, causes a great interest uh, uh, by students, by teachers, by everybody who wants to know um, something uh, that is regarded as a hot knowledge today. And I'm happy that despite of this um, somehow unsafety situation, uh, we did not show that we are weaker. Uh, otherwise, we show that we are strength enough to collect our forces and uh, to work as usual and even better even with greater efforts because now we have more possibilities to commu to communicate with each other i mean that this uh, online uh, conversation online conferences online discussions they really uh, help in and and allow us to work together to create um, flexible teams to collaborate even denser than we tried to do before. So I wish the workshop success and uh, I am happy once again to see all of you and discuss with you what I have prepared for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam that you agreed to join us on a very short notice. Now, I would like to invite Professor Kalpana Sharma, Head Department of Mathematics and Statistics, Manipal University, Zaipur, to give a brief introduction about the department and its activities. Madam, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahesh. A very good afternoon and uh, welcome in the international workshop on new trends in fuzzy and rough set theory and its application. Professor Dr. Irina, from Institute of Research and Applications of Fuzzy Modeling, University of Ostrava, Czech Republic, and Professor Dr. Sunil Jacob John from NIT Calicut. As a resource person for today's session, I welcome both of you, ma'am and sir. And uh, thank you very much for sparing your valuable time for this uh, workshop. I also welcome uh, Dean, Faculty of Science, Professor Anup Mukhopadhyay, Director Professor Lalita Ledwani. Because of their motivation and support, uh, we are able to conduct a series of uh, events, research events in, uh, with the, uh, the help of our faculty members. And I just want to tell you that this is the 14th in number for this academic session. So uh, this, this is a great effort putting by our own uh, faculty members. And uh, this is being organized by now uh, Dr. Mahesh. So thank you very much, Mahesh, for uh, doing this. Uh, I hope that this will be a very, very beneficial workshop for all the participants. Uh, it's a great pleasure indeed for welcoming me, all the participants who have joined for this uh, international uh, workshop. Uh, I think that after probability theory, fuzzy set theory and uh, rough set theory is a new mathematical tool for dealing with vague 
imprecise and inconsistent and uncertain knowledge and in recent years the researchers in application on rough set theory have attracted uh, more and more researchers attention so that is the reason that uh, has given us a motivation to conduct a workshop on uh, this particular topic and i hope that this workshop will give you an additional insight uh, about this and you will enjoy learning about uh, fuzzy and uh, rough set theory i also want to take this opportunity to brief uh, you all about the department of mathematics and statistics as our dean has uh, told you that uh, the university started uh, in 2011 and the same year the department of mathematics and statistics was established with an objective of offering a world class education and good research environment at present department is offering uh, three different programs bsc honors mathematics msc mathematics and phd in uh, various uh, areas of mathematics and uh, statistics the curriculum of ug and pg is design designed in a very uh, good manner the students are also involved for this uh, uh, preparing the curriculum and uh, the U, this uh, bsc honors mathematics uh, curriculum is designed in such a way that that it is having a good part of statistics also so let's say in future if a student wants to do uh, msc in mathematics or any other thing in related to mathematics they can go for it and for supporting all these kind of academic and research activities we are having uh, 23 dedicated faculty members in our department uh, and uh, they are enabling students to excel in the area of pure as well as uh, applied areas of mathematics and statistics so i hope that uh, this uh, workshop will be a great help for all the participants who wants to work in the area of fuzzy and uh, rough set theory and i once again uh, welcome and uh, convey my uh, sincere thanks to professor irina and uh, as well as professor uh, sunil for sparing their time thank you very much ma'am and sir and uh, i i extend again a warm welcome to all of you in this uh, workshop wish you a very happy learning thank you over to dr mahesh thank you madam let me now invite dr anand pratap singh junior researcher university of ostrava who is also the convener of this event now it's over to dr anand to start the today session uh, thank you mahesh for your brief introduction uh, hello everyone uh, i welcome you all to the first session of this workshop so today we will be having two invited talks from the eminent researchers i kindly request all of you to please mute your video and audio if you have any questions so kindly write in the chat box and after the each presentation i will bring them up to the speakers and then we will have a short discussion so now allow me to introduce our first speaker and our chief guest professor irina pirtleva she obtained her phd degree from moscow state university in russia at present she is a full professor at the university of ostrava czech republic she is also a head of theoretical research division at the institute for research and applications of fuzzy modeling she has published more than 300 papers in a reputed journals she is also a board member and honorary board member of european society for fuzzy logic and technology she <clears throat> has been conferred with the doctorary honor uh, on she has been conferred with the honorary doctorate from the university of latvia in latvia and honorary professor from the university uh, from the amity university in noida she is an area editor of the ieee transaction and for fuzzy system and also the editorial board members of the several journals to name a few fuzzy certain system soft computing iranian journal of fuzzy system fuzzy information and engineering uncertain system etc she is also a member of european society for fuzzy logic she is also a fellow of international fuzzy system association her scientific interest lies in the area of mathematical modeling fuzzy sets fuzzy topology During the last five years, she is actively working in the direction of image processing and deep learning. So it's all about uh, Professor Pirfleva. So now, without any further delay, I would like to hand over this session to Professor Pirfleva. So, Madam, please. 
So thank you, Anna, um, Anand, for very nice and pleasant introduction. And uh, let me start my uh, presentation right now. OK, so here, I hope that you see it. Please confirm. Do, do, do you see Hello. my slides? Uh, no, ma'am, it's not visible. Can you please share? OK, once again, I will try. Is it OK now? Do you yeah, see my it is now visible. No visible. Yes. yes. Yes, visible. Ah, OK, very good. So uh, as you see, the title of this presentation is uh, Inside to the Deep Convolutional Neural Nets. And moreover, I will try to connect this design with the so-called theory of fuzzy transforms. So here you see. OK, so I want to know navigation. So navigation somehow doesn't work. Ah, OK, so um, now you see the outline of this presentation. I will not read because I believe that you can do it quicker than me. And let us discuss the first slide, and this is the motivation. So as you see, deep neural networks, especially are dramatically improved classification performance. But however, the mathematical reasons for this success remain elusive. Therefore, so the main focus of many researchers and especially mathematicians are in direction of the explaining this success. Uh, the difficulty in this pr uh, process are caused by that now there exist a lot of papers where the discussion is given only locally. It is focused on some small details and do not create the whole picture. And therefore, my attempt today is just to discuss a little bit from the above and to show you how do I see this process from the analytical and functional point of view. So we will be focused uh, in detail in mathematical analysis of a computational model that is known as a convolutional neural network. And we will follow the normal uh, procedure of discussion, which is custom to uh, discussion of various algorithms. So we will discuss inputs, uh, the transformation steps, and uh, the outputs. OK, so um, as you see, uh, yeah. Uh, here you see some quotients uh, which I picked up from the Internet and they characterize CNNs. I will use this short name for convolutional neural networks. Uh, they characterize them as efficient structures for exploring structure of the image data. And moreover, the key property of a network is its ability to produce a good representation of data. So throughout this talk, I will discuss in more detail what does it mean, because as I said, we are focused on the problems that are solved. Yeah? And now we speak about representation of data. So this means that the solutions should, um, should be a processing of data which uh, transforms the original input data into sequence of uh, intermediate steps and finally it produces uh, the reasonable output. Uh, so to summarize, the deep neural network solves a classification problem uh, via creating a class label representation. And now we will focus on the classification problem. So what is classification and what is the peculiarity of classification when it is solved by a neural network? 
so normally, as everybody expects, a classification takes an input and labels it as belonging to a given class. So the output is categorical. So this, for example, means that classes can be labeled using uh, just numbers, natural numbers, one, two, three, and so forth. Yeah? And then with each input, a certain number is assigned, and this means labeling. However, these categorical outputs are not assigned when a deep neural net is processing the input data. Otherwise, uh, the output of uh, DNN uh, is the uh, so-called so um, um, system of distributions. Yeah, and by okay. this, we say that uh, a DNN solves uh, the so-called prediction task, means that each output is a certain probability to a class labeled categorically. And this means that uh, the output uh, that has the greatest value of the probability wins uh, the processing and the corresponding label is finally assigned. Moreover, the peculiarity of the processing is not just transforming from input data to output data. Um, the output uh, is assigned through the so-called optimization uh, process. And by this we mean that um, before the uh, normal uh, feed-forward processing starts, there should be the process that is known as learning or training the neural net. And during this training, the optimization in the form of minimizing a certain criteria uh, that is connected with the so-called loss function is performed. Uh, however, in my talk, I will not go into the details of a uh, learning procedure uh, because now we assume that the learning more or less has been performed and we discuss the processing of input data, how it is performed by a neural network. OK, so here you see uh, uh, yeah, just a toy illustration of uh, classification. Yeah, here you see labels. This means that uh, this is the so-called uh, categorical uh, classification. Yeah, and also you can see that the last on the right picture yeah, is, a, is a kind of mixture yeah, between cats and dogs. Yeah, and therefore these borderline examples, they normally cause some difficulties. So, just to summarize this first introductory par, uh, part, uh, I want to stress that the main focus of this talk is to give an overview of some convolutional neural nets and describe them as computational models that are suitable for performing classification through a sequence of good representations of the data. Yeah? So this is crucial, so please remember uh, this claim. We will discuss uh, the following details, inputs, layers, outputs, then requirements to transformation steps and initialization. We will not discuss learning. The last remark uh, to this uh, overview is that um, despite we proclaim that the focus is on a good representation of data, this good representation of data is not unique. And therefore, we will show some architectures and see how they can be improved or simplified in order to solve the same problem. OK, so now we start some details. Yeah, principle of computations. Uh, I hope that everybody is familiar with the basic principles. However, I will just recall very shortly some important details. First of all, the general characterization that was given by uh, the researcher which is connected with the uh, probably first well-known deep convolutional uh, neural network uh, that is known as LENET, yeah, is the uh, Jan Lekun. And according to his uh, characterization, deep network is a parametric model that performs sequential operations on the input data. Yeah, this is very clever sentence that really characterizes the essence. 
uh, every operation in each layer consists of a linear transformation, uh, in other words, convolution, and it is followed by a nonlinear activation function, for example, sigmoid, but this is not only one possibility. So below at this slide, you see um, the illustration of one computational uh, unit that is known as neural, a neuron, and then you see uh, one example of the so-called uh, multiple layer perceptron with two hidden layers. Yeah, this uh, MLP again, I will use this short name, was the first successful model of neural nets uh, that was really widely exploited in various even class uh, complicated classification uh, problems. So let us start discussion with principle of MLPs and then show uh, where is the main difference between MLPs and CNNs. Uh, first of all, computation performed by MLP is just a sequence of transformations. And as we characterized before, if an MLP has K layers, then at each layer, uh, the following transformation is performed. Um, so each layer is connected with a certain matrix that represents a linear transformation applied to the output of the previous layer. Yeah, and then after that, after this matrix multiplication, the nonlinear activation function is applied. So altogether, uh, the final output here it is denoted by capital X K. Yeah. Uh, is, as I said, is a kind of probability distribution uh, between C uh, classes. So as you see, if we summarize all step and characterize the whole processing as a sequence of transformation, then mathematically uh, we can express the output. Here now I am discussing the last uh, bottom line at this slide, so we see that starting from the input and to the output, yeah, there is performed a certain sequence of matrix multiplications followed by non-linear activations. What is interesting here? So we shall ask the first question. Okay, so yeah, we perform this processing and what we obtain as a result? Um, what with this functionality uh, is possible to uh, characterize. Uh, there is one where, very well known and very um, highly cited result signed by um, uh, Kurt Hornig and the year 1989, uh, who showed that neural networks with a single hidden layer and sigmoid activations are universal function approximators. However, we will discuss um, a, a related paper uh, by another author, uh, George Tsibenka, the same year, but published later, where this uh, claim, this result about universal approximation explained in more details. And I would like to discuss first these details. For example, Sibenka showed, yeah, this is not the final result, but one intermediate result that is very important in my opinion. So he showed that for a single closed set, um, and this is a subset in the nth dimensional cube, and the continuous function f epsilon on this cube where, look, so this function is expressed as the first expression in this slide. Yeah. Um, so for this function, later we will discuss its semantical meaning. But for this function, there exists a continuous function G, again on the same domain. And here you see the representation of, of G such that the absolute difference for all X yeah, is less than one half. So, now mini. So look what this function f epsilon actually means. Yeah, it specifies the closed um, region D in a certain sense that it gives something like smooth 
characteristic function of this region means that when points are close to a point designated as y and y belongs to this region then the value of this function is close to one yeah and otherwise if a point is far from any point from d the value of this function is close to zero yeah so as i see the precise characterization of the uh, characteristic function of d and exactly this function is represented in the form of small g as you see the lower expression and this means that yeah uh, the discrimination here is enough to solve the decision problem this means that to separate points in d from the points uh, outside of d so this means that uh, in terms of universal approximation, yeah, as uh, we discussed above, when we spoke that every continuous function can be approximated by a neural network, this means that a continuous function is represented, uh, of course, approximately, with the help of certain flat layers where it more or less has um, similar values close to some designated values, yeah, a kind of valleys or flat regions. And then um, the underlying uh, domain, underlying subsets of the n-dimensional cube are connected with uh, this or that uh, flat or constant value of this function. And the role of neural net is classification means that to separate if an input point yeah, is within the piece of domain where we know this or that functional value, then neural net should recognize this. So just to illustrate this command, I would like to show you how uh, this approximation of a continuous, so in this case, it's not a, it's it's function uh, lying uh, on a higher dimensional space. So therefore, it is represented as a surface. Yeah, as you see, this surface is approximated by a finite number of flat subregions, and the role of a neural net is to discriminate. Uh, domains that uh, that correspond to each uh, subregion. So and see, uh, so no, what is important is that the representation of approximating function that was denoted by small g can be computed using here you see uh, multiple layer perceptron. So this is a close connection between. Uh, the theoretical result regarding approximation and the realization by a neural net that performs only computation. Yeah, of course, here we assume that this net is already uh, is already trained. Yeah, and another thing which is important is that the activation denoted here by sigma is one for the whole network so it's not uh, just depending on a um, just active or non-active neural yeah again yeah this is a kind of characteristic of the whole net and then what is important else what what is actually learned uh, if the neural net is not trained before weights weights here are designated by y J's, yeah, T means that they are in the process of learning, yeah, so T is changing. So this means that these uh, values, I, J's, they characterize the domains uh, because they give their specification of the domains as the some, something like eigenvector of the corresponding region of the domain. And exactly these vectors are learned through the trained process. This is very important because this is the similar idea that we will further see when we discuss deep neural nets. Okay, so now let's discuss 
uh, the differences between convolutional neural nets and um, uh, perceptrons. So here you see the list of these uh, of differences, and uh, they cover inputs, uh, computation, activations, and outputs. I will not discuss because I believe that everybody knows yeah, these details. Yeah. Only I want to say that instead of sigmoid activation, mostly in uh, CNNs, <laughs> There is some noise. Eh? Uh, the function that is known as ReLU, and this is piecewise function that is uh, really a piecewise uh, linear approximation of a uh, sigmoid. OK, so uh, the principal difference um, between CNNs and MLPs is that the dimension of the input space is uh, is higher. I mean that uh, CNN is able to process uh, high dimensional data. And therefore, uh, if we compare in terms of inputs, yeah, in the case of MLPs, mostly we have vector inputs. Here we have tensors as inputs. This means that for inputs we consider uh, something like matrices with uh, vector uh, entries. And then this structure is processed through all layers of this neural net. Uh, OK, so some details Yeah. now. Uh, convolution. Uh, as I said, uh, CNN inputs are, in case there are images, there are third order tensors, 3D tensors, yeah, in other uh, term. Uh, and they are characterized by, of course, three, um, uh, three values, yeah, and they designate uh, height, width, and uh, channel, I mean, uh, color channel. For example, uh, the you know, more or less um, very well known and very um, frequently used uh, neural net, AlexNet, uh, its inputs are of this type of uh, dimension. I will not read. And if we perform a convolution of 3D tensors, then uh, this convolution is performed with the help of similar dimensional kernels, again, 3D kernels. And here you see the expression that characterizes how this convolution is performed. And again, what is important as is that for convolution we use the matrix representation. Here this matrix is corresponded to the so-called kernel. What I want to show, yeah, just now we are going to characterize the functional characterization of the whole process of uh, transformation from inputs to outputs. And in this respect, I want to show that from the point of view of computation, deep neural net behaves similar to multi-layer perceptron. This simil by this similarity, I mean the following thing. Yeah. If we stick to one-dimensional data, I mean vector data as input data, and we consider for the kernel what, what you see here, um, capital W with only two entrance, uh, entrances because we uh, process uh, one dimensional data. Uh, then the convolution uh, performed by this kernel can be represented as the matrix multiplication where an input vector is multiplied by the weight matrix which is um, depicted uh, here in the middle. Yeah, and here you see the construction of this convolutional matrix. So you see the kernel is repeated. Yeah, and it is translated or it is shifted through columns of this matrix. So this means that if we make this association, then we can easily come to the conclusion that uh, similar to uh, MLP CNN performs universal approximation of um, 
let, let me say of some associated function yeah uh, in this case function um, takes inputs from uh, higher dimensional spaces um, then uh, the principal difference between MLPs and CNNs consists uh, actually in two things yeah from again from the functional point of view first of all neurons in the same layer share their weights and this simplifies the complexity of computation because as you see weights yeah as again we see how the convolutional matrix is constructed then we see that each column actually uh, correspond to one layer um, computation and you see that weights really are the same yeah and this is really significant for the learning process because it requires less parameters to be learned the second thing is that neurons in different layers approximate other than flat shapes yeah as you remember we discussed when we spoke about uh, perceptron uh, how it processes a continuous function then uh, we stressed that um, actually the um, classification is performed uh, this classification is classification between flat layers or their corresponding domains here in the cnn computation we do not work with flat layers yeah but with um, uh, layers uh, or with areas that correspond to approximate um, values of the uh, input uh, in this case surface uh, and um, these approximate uh, areas uh, have more complex construction that uh, than flat areas i will show you some uh, illustration later now again to summarize some principal differences uh, between CNN and MLP. Um, so what I try to explain regarding uh, the uh, representation of the input surface data is that the input data is considered as a manifold and this is principal uh, difference between CNNs and MLP. And this manifold uh, actually um, is a uh, low dimensional um, space uh, in a certain sense that is embedded in a high dimensional space. This means that uh, actually the data uh, only for the first glance is a high dimensional. Uh, its intrinsic dimension is lower and the purpose of CNN is to uh, extract uh, the relevant lower dimension from the original high dimension yeah this is very important we will discuss it later um, the process uh, of uh, transformation is divided into uh, actually two parts yeah the first part uh, convolutional part in fact is the um, is devoted to feature extraction we will discuss what do we mean by features and the second part is devoted to the classification itself. Yeah, we will not speak about classification today. Um, I mean, deeply. Yeah, so we will focus only on feature extraction. Uh, what does it mean? The feature extraction is a sequence of reductions on the tangent spaces and their meaningful combinations. Yeah, this is also very important uh, claim. Yeah, uh, because as we said, the purpose of CNN is to uh, extract or produce a low dimensional manifold uh, that is approximating structure for the original input data and the manifold can be considered as a collection of its tangent play, uh, spaces and in uh, further layers yeah because we speak about deep layer network uh, these uh, tangent spaces are specified in more detail uh, by uh, their combinations. And actually, uh, uh, what is going on? Yeah, if we have a tangent space, one, yeah, particular, then we represent it by its basis vectors. And these basis vectors, they are in principle many for um, sorry, they are eigenvectors of this tangent plane. And uh, 
what is uh, doing by, by convolution? Convolution uh, computes the projections on these basis vectors. And actually the values of these projections are uh, so-called features yeah, that are computed and then combined. And this is the main sense uh, or, and this is the principal difference also between MLPs and CNNs. Let me show you now uh, illustration. So look, so here you see high dimensional surface and its tangent planes that should be extracted by a neural network. Yeah, extracted means that uh, they assume to approximate the original surface as we see here. Yeah. And altogether, these tangent plays, when they tiled uh, or composed, uh, they give a global representation of a surface. Uh, then each local part, patch of a, you know, I mean, local piece yeah, or local tangent plane, uh, one particular, um, is known as a patch, or uh, people say that this is a kind of pancake, uh, and uh, what is important is that it is assumed that, so they are constructed yeah, in the way that the variance in the directions that are orthogonal to these planes yeah, should be small, while variances um, uh, that follow directions of uh, basis vectors, uh, they should be large. Yeah? So this is the idea how they are um, computed. OK, so as a summary, we see that classification uh, performed by CNN is a procedure that divides a high dimensional object in, into a set of tangent planes. Then each tangent plane is determined by its local directions, eigenvectors of the corresponding kernel. Projections on these directions are features and the object is identified with a sufficient two classification combination of features. The last claim is also very important because we do not want to, up to uh, produce uh, the approximation of the initial um, dependence. Yeah, so we extract as much features as we need to perform classification, yeah, and as I said, yeah, so we start from one layer to other layers where on the first layer we extract the so-called geometrical features that have meaning and then we combine them and through these combinations we are close to make classification. Okay, now we are close to discuss, um, I mean, the uh, what we can do with the uh, theory of fuzzy sets and uh, especially with the theory of F transform. Uh, as you can guess, yeah, uh, when I described the behavior of CNN, I characterized it uh, uh, globally without any specification. And what is principle is that um, the, um, uh, the surface, the manifold uh, that is computed by a CNN, uh, is represented by a collection of tangent planes. Tangent planes are characterized by, um, by corresponding kernels, and kernels can be selected in different ways. So uh, the kernels of um, various um, well-known uh, new, uh, convolutional neural nets, for example, AlexNet or LeNet, uh, ResNet, so they um, they are different, so they specify each neural net. And therefore, we will try to show that starting from the theory of fuzzy transforms, we can also propose specific kernels that can be used um, as sufficiently as other kernels are used in well-known neural nets. So this is our purpose. Just to support this idea, I want to show you the first layer kernels of the Alex net. And as we uh, see, um, I mean, as you uh, see or try to extract the meaning of these kernels, yeah, then we can characterize this meaning as follows. For example, the top left kernel uh, shows um, something like edge detection through the direction 
that is um, um, that is uh, sharpened on this um, uh, on this cell, yeah, as you see. And then uh, actually the whole first uh, row uh, just is um, um, is composed of uh, so-called gradient kernels. They extract edges with respect to the directions that are correspond to each uh, particular kernel. Yeah. So you see. So if uh, yeah, this means that because we have many edges and edges in pictures because mostly we are focused on image processing and therefore extraction of edges is very important for classification. And then in the bottom part yeah, of this collection of kernels, we see so-called colored blobs. This means that also the, uh, I mean, color um, distribution is very important uh, for making classification. OK, now we will discuss uh, the um, uh, particular topic that is close to the um, fuzzy transform theory and therefore I will briefly uh, remind you the notion of fuzzy sets, fuzzy numbers and fuzzy partition. The principal notion of fuzzy transform is fuzzy partition. Fuzzy partition is a collection of fuzzy sets or fuzzy numbers. It depends on the domain. If we work on the domain of real numbers then we as uh, units, we have uh, fuzzy numbers. So fuzzy partition for us is a collection, uh, as I said, yeah, of uh, fuzzy numbers on the interval because we work on the real line. So we have a, a restricted domain that is interval. And the sequence can be finite or infinite, but of course, uh, when we make applications, we work only with finite number of fuzzy sets in a fuzzy partition. The only property that is required is the so-called covering. Uh, this means that each point from uh, the interval is assumed to be covered, means that the value of the uh, fuzzy unit uh, should be positive. OK, so here you see some illustration of possible fuzzy partitions. On the left side, we see uh, partitions of exactly interval. In this case, this is interval 0, 9. And on the right ha uh, hand side, you see the partition of two dimensional space of some rectangular area. Then, uh, with each um, sub interval uh, that, um, um, that partition uh, the uh, original domain, we correspond the so-called um, fuzzy set or um, we call it uh, uh, just uh, identifying fuzzy set with its membership function we call this basic function and um, if partition is uniform this means that uh, it is constructed with the help of shifting and rescaling on one particular function and this function should be even continuous bell shaped and vanishing outside the designated interval minus one one then this function is called generating function moreover we normalize this function by this integral value so here you see the illustration of a uniform fuzzy partition performed by a generating function yeah, so you see the uh, generating function is um, connected with the origin and then it is rescaled as it is shown on the right and shifted. OK, so here uh, you see some examples of generating functions. Mostly in our applications, we work with two examples. One is triangular shaped function and another is raised cosine. And then what is important is that with each generating function, we can correspond, we can construct the corresponding kernel. So here on the uh, actually um, first itemized line, you see how from a generating function A0, we can uh, come to a corresponding kernel. Uh, OK, so and, uh, as an example, um, at the bottom, yeah, you see uh, the triangular um, generating function and the corresponding kernel. And uh, if, if you remember our uh, theorem of Tsibenka, 
uh, exactly this kernel appeared uh, as as a um, characterization of a certain closed domain to be uh, after that approximated by a neural net. So this is important, yeah? And so here you see that if we correspond every basic uh, or every generating function with a uh, corresponding kernel, then we can create a kernel partition matrix as I showed you when we discussed uh, the computational um, capacity of um, uh, convolutional neural nets. Now, uh, let me say that um, uh, besides the kernel we just discussed, the F-transform can have so-called uh, high-dimensional kernel, and therefore we call it high-degree uh, high F-transform. So the kernel of this high-degree F-transform are connected with um, eigen vectors or better say eigen functions uh, that correspond to this or that kernel and they expressed with the help of weighted orthogonal polynomials. I will not go into the details so you see the reference to the paper where details are discussed. But here I want to show you uh, that um, um, with the help of F1 transform um, how the approximation of a smooth curve um, can be performed with the help of F1 transform. And uh, if you remember the slide that characterizes uh, the um, low dimensional manifold, uh, then you immediately see similarities uh, between uh, the uh, construction of low dimensional manifold, approximating manifolds and uh, this picture. Again, I do not have time to um, explain details. Here in this slide, there is some information uh, about the second degree, that is uh, F2 transform. And if you can guess, the projection is performed on the local polynomials of the second degree, yeah, contrast to the F1 transform, where we use um, pieces of lines as first order um, tangent planes. Okay, so here uh, this slide, slide shows how um, components uh, or better say coefficients of the original function um, can be computed uh, using the uh, so-called weight projection on the eigen um, in this case, function of the corresponding kernels. So here you see, yeah, by this we have so-called features, yeah, as I stressed when I uh, discussed what features are actually when we speak about um, manifolds. So here we use actually two-dimensional manifolds that are characterized uh, each um, local uh, by uh, three features. Okay. Now you see the uh, graphical illustration uh, of kernels that are associated with the F second transform, F2 transform. Yeah. Actually, you see that these kernels, um, um, so here, yeah, uh, in the bottom line, uh, the, this particular kernel corresponds to F0 transform, then it is flipped. Uh, then two kernels for F1 transform. And then you see again that they reminds you uh, the kernels that um, um, uh, that uh, actually um, are used for um, edge detection. Uh, and other two kernels um, correspond to uh, F2 transform. They are so-called Laplacians and they correspond to curve characterization. Okay, so yeah, um, uh, again, unfortunately, time is uh, running, yeah, and so this, I want only to show you some theoretical result that justifies the approximation quality of this type of approximation by uh, high degree F transform uh, components. And now our experiments with the neural net. So after we, you know, during our discussion, uh, always um, make a correspondence uh, between computation and um, 
its characterization um, in terms of neural nets, then now we are focused on realization uh, of uh, this computation um, through the neural net that was designed um, uh, using the f transform kernels. So as a prototype, we call it um, baseline. We selected at the beginning uh, LENET, as uh, I uh, discussed at the beginning. Yeah, this LENET was proposed by the author with the name Jan Lekun. Um, and this is the first example of successful deep convolutional neural net that was trained on the so-called database MNIST with, um, uh, with uh, integers from 0 to 9. So uh, it is deep, but not that much deep as we see uh, later. So look, we took this LENET 5 as a baseline and then we replace, uh, I mean, general convolutional kernels uh, that I learned they are not initialized, uh, I mean, uh, with their semantical meaning. So we replaced them by the F transform kernels whose semantical meaning is clear to us. And then we trained this FT net, yeah, so the um, resulting uh, neural net is called FT net. FT means uh, it is completed with the F transform kernels. We trained it on these databases, yeah, as you see the names, and here you see specification of objects from these data sets, yeah. So there are images. Um, at the first line, you see resolutions uh, and then uh, colors and so on and so forth. Yeah, and then classes. As you see, our simple, quite simple neural net is able not only to classify, to classify using 10 classes as MNIST or CIFAR, yeah, but also make classification with larger number of classes. And here you see the um, um, success rates. Uh, of um, our neural net on the uh, discussed above data sets. So here you see MNIST, CIFAR, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And as you see, uh, so it is compared uh, with the uh, baseline, uh, I mean with the LENET neural network. And our set with our kernels outperforms that uh, because it is depicted in red as you see red here is above this means that yeah so the um, um, plot that goes down uh, characterizes uh, the loss function the yeah, behavior of the loss function and the plot that goes up characterizes the uh, success and as you see for example for mnist so yeah the behavior is better than the behavior of uh, lenet yeah and similar we see for CIFAR and other databases. OK, so. Uh, uh, so this we just uh, uh, discussed uh, that, yeah, we uh, actually um, made experiments with training and without training. And uh, in both cases, the success rate was quite high. What is also important is that even um, even when a training procedure is activated, our kernels are not that much changed. Yeah, this means that learning, um, of course, affects the shapes of kernels, but not that much. Yeah, so you see the first line shows kernels as they were initialized, means that they are original F transform kernels. And the bottom line shows uh, how they changed after training, if training is activated. And as you see, the semantical characteristic of the kernels uh, did not change. And this is very important. Yeah. So then we made other, uh, we made other experiments uh, with other uh, neural nets. And here I will show you how um, also we made experiments with the uh, modern uh, neural net uh, that is known as uh, ResNet. 
so the idea of ResNet is different. I will not discuss. Yeah, but this is one of the uh, most successful neural nets that I used um, on the market, especially for classification of um, huge data sets with uh, uh, somehow 1000 uh, classes. Uh, here you see ResNet uh, 20. 20 means that it has um, 20 blocks. And then uh, we did the same thing. Yeah, so we replaced the kernels uh, that are normally initialized uh, randomly. We replaced them with F transform kernels and consider the um, success and the uh, process uh, how this uh, set um, process the input data. And as you see, we compared with other initialization, which is um, according to uh, another name, uh, he. Uh, and as you see, so for 20, for the structure with uh, 20 blocks, uh, so our realization is uh, more successful yeah, uh, than the uh, baseline uh, initialization. Uh, then we increase the number of blocks. Here we see uh, 32. And then um, in this case, so our um, neural net uh, also um, improves the classification rate but not as high as uh, the uh, classical normalization. Yeah, and in the case of um, a structure with uh, 44 blocks, uh, again, yeah, so here you see the performance is almost similar with the baseline um, initialization, yeah, but um, uh, our set is a bit lower. So when we mm, uh, think about um, what we shall do in order to also have the uh, similar success rate, then uh, we decided to increase the number of kernels. Yeah, so uh, as you see, yeah, we used only two kernels and then we use their combinations. Yeah, uh, so through layer to layer. Um, and if, uh, yeah, so this means that only second degree F transform kernels are in use. And therefore, our guess is that if we increase uh, the degree of the F transform and, and use more, more kernels, yeah, of course, the uh, neural net will be more complicated, but in this direction, we can improve its um, um, uh, successful rate. Okay, so yeah, uh, this is just uh, yeah, shortly what I wanted to discuss with you. And as conclusions, yeah, I would like yeah, to read uh, the following sentences. Uh, just to remind you the uh, whole lecture. First of all, we discussed deep neural nets as computational models, and they and we show that their operation is similar to the operation of uh, multiple layer um, perceptrons. Then, the whole processing of data sets consists of transformation of data objects in two sets of features. And the latter are results of weighted projections on lower dimensional spaces. So this means that we just explain the meaning of features because normally when we read scientific paper, uh, so we use, uh, we very frequently see uh, this uh, terminology, feature extraction and things like that, but no body, but no meaning. And in our approach, I wanted to assign a meaning to features. Yeah, as you see, features yeah, are just um, projections on selected basis vectors of tangent spaces. Yeah, uh, and this is very important. Yeah, um, so this is just the third sentence. I will not read. And finally, a deep neural network with only eight F eight because we. Um, um, we used, as I said, uh, second order F transform, but from kernels we use additional transformations like flipping and uh, assigning uh, more rotation degrees to F1 transform kernels. So altogether we have eight different kernels, but of the second degree. So we have very good um, uh, success when we process the well-known uh, data sets. So thank you for your attention. That is all uh, from myself, and I would be happy to discuss with you the results. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Pirfileva, for your thought-provoking talk. 
So now I open this uh, session for the discussion. So from the participants, if you have any questions, so you can ask directly to the pro Professor Pilfilega. Hello. Anyone from the audience? Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Irina. I am uh, Dr. Rajveer uh, from Manipal only. So I was just trying to uh, understand that in terms of the uh, rate of convergence, if you use the fuzzy transforms, uh, how uh, much accelerated uh, this fuzzy term? They took more time or less time? Uh, of course, it takes less time. It's a very good question, yeah? Uh, because, you know, so the learning takes not only time, yeah? Uh, because uh, the deep neural nets, um, they normally uh, take days for being trained. And this means that uh, they take a lot of energy, yeah? just uh, electricity power, yeah, and whatever, yeah? And yeah. if and if we see uh, how it is difficult really from this point of view, uh, then um, we agree that the in initialization with, with kernels uh, whose semantical meaning is known is um, very promising in this direction because it saves not only efforts, uh, but also consumption. Okay, okay. So, uh did you uh, compare any to uh, one any application applying both the methods? Uh, are there some studies you made for a given uh, problem? Once again, uh, can I mean, did you apply uh, both the methods, uh, DNN and one using the fuzzy transform, on a application where uh, we could compare those uh, uh, advantages uh, in a more application-oriented manner? Uh, you know, so yeah, uh, we have some, um, I mean, industrial applications, uh, of course, yeah, and they are for, course, for example, we are very successful uh, in the application of um, uh, recognizing license plates of cars, yeah, you know, so this is also a big problem. There are many cameras installed on roads, and uh, to recognize the license plate, it, it, the, this task is very um, difficult because the recognition depends on weather condition, yeah, on um, uh, somehow noise um, that is caused by uh, fast moving of cars and, and other things, yeah. And when we um, used the um, F-transform processing for this type of recognition, uh, so our results are um, better than uh, the results that are produced by uh, automatic software recognition systems. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Irina. Thank you. Hello, ma'am. How do you manage the parameters uh, we are using in your algorithm, ma'am, please? Parameters. Yeah. Uh, parameters, what do you mean parameters? In Which your, your algorithm, like classification functions and in your algorithm also? use some parameters, no? Uh, yes, yeah, if you mean, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, um, as I stressed, uh, mostly we work um, with the uh, triangular um, partitions. This means that at the beginning, uh, we selected the particular type of our kernels. And then we, uh, um, uh, so these are, um, in a certain sense, um, basic kernels for us. And then when we uh, increase uh, the uh, degrees of our kernel, uh, we again, we selected uh, polynomials as eigen, um, as uh, orthogonal eigen vectors. But in this respect, uh, we could select other uh, type of, um, let me say, kernels instead of um, triangle, we can select 
uh, smooth. We can even work with Gaussian kernels, yeah. And then instead again of polynomial eigenvector functions, we can work with trigonometrical um, uh, uh, functions or more complicated. But you know, so this is again a, a balance or trade-off uh, between uh, complexity and uh, uh, success of um, convergence, yeah, or convergence rate, yeah. And in our experiments, we realized that uh, it is um, totally enough to work with simpler versions of our kernels. Yeah, I mean, uh, piecewise linear uh, basic functions and then polynomials um, for a higher degree of transform. Oh, yes, ma'am. So it, sometimes it is by a trial and error only. Mm -hmm. Now I do not listen to you. Yeah, but but uh, yeah, but I, I, I can form. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the explosion. Thank you for your question. Uh, hello, ma'am. I have a question. I am audible to you. Uh, yeah, I listen, but I do not see you. But uh, anything. Okay. Uh, I, so I see your name. Yeah. Can you see me now? Yeah, no, no, yes. OK. Yeah. OK, so my question is about it. How do we choose the activation function? Like the firstly, you talked about the activation function, but you didn't mention any criteria for choosing the activation function, or we just go by hit and trial method and notice the accuracy of the model with different layers. Uh, you know, so we just keep the uh, standard activation, which is um, uh, performed by ReLU function. Yeah, this is piecewise mm -hmm. linear because, uh, as I said, yeah, we try to save computational efforts and this mm -hmm. function. Uh, first of all, it nicely approximates the um, the um, this um, sigmoidal function, yeah. And this sigmoidal function, um, as the theory uh, shows, yeah, is enough for uh, performing uh, the um, the sharpness actually, yeah. So the role of uh, activation function is to uh, keep values that are close to one, even closer, and uh, if they are close to zero, to make them even closer to zero, yeah, just to sharpening the results. Yeah, and yeah. in this respect, it is totally enough yeah, to keep uh, this piecewise linear function uh, because, uh, as I said, yeah, it saves uh, computation time. It is, it is, it, it is simpler. Okay, but but there are some data sets where the, I think the sigmoid function is not very uh, reasonable to use because if, if, for example, in medical sciences, we talk about the cancer and we classify the cancer in two categories, then the, of course the ReLU function has uh, more advantage over the sigmoid function. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. However, you know, so uh, it's a matter really of experiments. Uh, unfortunately, in this respect, you know, uh, as I stressed, uh, what is um, important to understand is that sometimes uh, the classification is difficult to be performed uh, um, because when you train, you train your data on well separated data. But uh, when real data comes, yeah, um, it cannot be on a kind of a border yeah, between classes. And this is very difficult yeah, to um, then make a decision, yeah, let me say. And um, in this case, yeah, if it happens, yeah, for example, if your probabilities uh, do not indicate exactly uh, which class should be selected, yeah, probably the, uh, I mean, smooth, uh, the smooth um, uh, activation is preferable. But as I said, this is a matter of experience. Yeah, uh, other advice is uh, to um, uh, to prolong the. Um, set of um, uh, convolution kernels to make uh, this uh, first part, convolution part, yeah, or extraction part longer, even longer, because as I said, it is responsible for creating a meaningful combination of features. Yeah, and when you have a difficulty with recognition, this means that uh, the existing combination is not enough. Yeah, for making uh, separation, and this means that you shall add additional layer, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, for for additional combination. Okay, thank you. And also, like then, also the with the layers, but how do we choose about the weights of the different layers? 
um, uh, yeah, as I said, ways I, I, I just values yeah, um, of our uh, of our kernels. Yeah, we normally uh, do not uh, we uh, do not learn weights or uh, this is one possibility. Of course, we can learn uh, even already uh, initialized weights, but weights are tightly correspond to our kernels. Therefore, they are given beforehand, yeah? Because as I said, we selected F-transform kernels and they totally characterize the whole weights in all layers of our network. Okay, okay. But also in some models, if we know already the interest and the outcome, then we it's possible to choose the weights in advance. But if you go by some like data, the things that we do in unsupervised machine learning, but where we don't know anything about how our data is going to perform, then in that case, the weights are going to be choose uh, the weights that we are going to choose is gonna be very difficult. Yeah, 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 I agree. Yeah, but we distinguish. So in this talk, yeah, mainly I was focused on supervised neural nets. Yeah, but mm -hmm. if you work with unsupervised, yeah, uh, mainly you do uh, this um, in two steps. First of all, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You um, um, you trained the so-called autoencoder, yeah. Mm -hmm. You mean so is the unsupervised uh, neural net, uh, mm -hmm. and the uh, first part, yeah, the feature extraction part, yeah, actually nicely um, extract the relevant features, and then these features, yeah, can mm -hmm. be fed into. Uh, other neural net uh, that is responsible for classification because autoencoder only reproduces yeah, the original inputs. They are used only for um, feature extraction. But uh, there is one, um, you know, uh, so do not take it absolutely uh, mm -hmm. because uh, when you train autoencoders as non supervised neural nets, mm -hmm. then uh, you cannot um, you cannot create combination of features because features are selected only on the basis of similarity. Yeah, yeah. and this is restrictive. So this mm -hmm. means that after selecting features, yeah, you shall increase the uh, number of layers of your deep neural net uh, that is um, uh, that is used for further classification. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. That's all uh, from us. Thank you so much. Ma'am, we have one more question from the live session as well uh, from the Mohammed Ilyas. He asked that what is the work of activation function? Uh, activation function. Activation function, I, I already discussed. Normally we use ReLU. Mm -hmm. And he has another question as well. Uh, what is the difference between artificial neural networks and simply neural network? What, what do you mean by simple? So neural networks yeah, are called normally artificial because uh, they are, uh, say, computational models of biological uh, neurons. Yeah. So uh, in terms of neural networks, so, so we distinguish between biological and artificial. Yeah. When we work with, uh, um, I mean, um, computer realization, uh, we create artificial neural nets. OK, OK, so. So I think now we, we don't have more questions and we are running short of time, so let me say you thank you again that you joined us on a very short notice. So thank you, Professor Berkeleva for your nice talk. So thank let you me so know. Much. Yeah. Thank you let so much. Know. Yeah, yeah, and I will follow the further discussion, so I hope that later also I will be active. Yeah, and uh put some questions uh, and uh, participate in discussion so would like to the uh, workshop yeah i ask the participants if you have any doubt so you can directly reach to the uh, our speaker professor if perkleva through her email id and you can ask your question as well so now let me invite uh, mahesh to introduce our second speaker for the today's session so mahesh please Thank you, Dr. Anand. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Sunil Jacobzon. Professor Sunil Jacobzon obtained MSc, MPhil, and PhD in mathematics from Kochi University of Science and Technology, 
in India. Presently, he is working as a professor at the Department of Mathematics, National Institute of Technology, Calicut, Kerala, India. He is editorial board member of uh, Medical Sciences and uh, Technology, International Journal of Life Sciences and Technology. He is also reviewer of mathematical reviews uh, in American Mathematical Society, Computer and Mathematics with Applications, International Journal of Computer Mathematics, International Journal of Approximate Reasoning. He is author of two books and more than 100 research publications in na national and international reputed journal. His research interest lies in the area of multi-state topology, automata theory, and dimension theory. So far, he has supervised 11 PhD candidates. Now, without further delay, I would like to hand over the session to Professor Sunil Jacob Zone. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Dr. Mahesh Kumar. And thank you, Dr. Anand. And uh, uh, thank you, the organizers, for inviting me for this particular webinar program. And I think I, I, will start, I will start without any delay since it is already time is uh, passing. Therefore, uh, I think I can present now. Yes, sir, you can proceed now. Okay. Thank you for all nice words on me. Thank you. Well, I hope my slides are visible. It is visible. Yes. I am audible also, I think. Yes, yes. Yeah, you are audible. Thank you. Th thank you, Dr. Mahesh. Yeah. Now, the title of my presentation, I have given us set generalizations for soft computing and decision making. And obviously, I know that the Trust that is given in this particular program is fuzzy sets and rough sets. And fuzzy sets and rough sets are particular type of generalizations of sets. And hence, I hope that this set generalizations in general will be worth mentioning in the beginning day. And also we will see what is soft computing. And that is a term that is widely used here and it is of much important nowadays and we'll see how these things can be applied for decision making in fact the structure of my talk will be like this we'll have the preliminaries regarding generalized sets or rather we start from the very beginning of set theory and what was the need for going for generalized structures like fuzzy sets rough sets, soft sets are there, multi sets are there. There are so many generalized structures occurring. And what is the need for going such a such structures? And what is the uh, lack that we felt in usual or rather crisp set theory? And how it was tackled and how the problems of this Kandorian set theory were settled. That we will be seen in the first part as in the preliminaries. Then we see what is of computing, very basic definitions and uh, the terminologies that we used in soft computing. And then we go for some generalized set theoretic structures in this context, maybe some hybrid structures. We will see what is a hybrid structure and what is the significance of hybrid section and what is the advantages of hybridization. Those things we will see and uh, possibly we will end up with uh, one application and I will choose one application from one of these hybrid structures that is called uh, subsets. In fact, fuzzy subsets is a hybrid structure of fuzzy sets and subsets and we will see one application and uh, that will be the final part of the lecture. Now, as I mentioned, we will start from the definition of set itself and uh, we, may, we know that the concept of set is very fundamental in the entire mathematics and uh, 
Kander, George Kander was believed to be the father of set theory. It was formulated by George Kander. And uh, I told you that uh, I, I tried to assume nothing in the sense that it will start with uh, the very definition of set given by Kander. And you can see the definition that is given by Kander here. The, this is the original definition given by Kander. And this definition, which is revolutionized every branch of mathematics, the original definition is in German. And uh, those who don't know German, I can give the English translation of that. This is a translation. And by a set, we understand any collection into a whole, capital M of definite distinct objects, small m, which will be called elements of capital M of our intuition or of our thought. This is the English translation of Candace's definition to a set. Now you can see that this definition seems more philosophical rather than mathematical. Maybe because of in the ancient time, there was not much difference between mathematicians as well as philosophers. That may be the reason. And the two things I have given in bold in that definition, that is definite distinct objects. The Faranda may be in the high school classes, the teachers may be teaching you that is defined as said and you might have defined it is a well defined collection of objects obviously that's a definition that we all know and I, that is what is the essence of Kant's definition there are some things are something is allowed and something is not allowed that allowed thing is that uh, it should be definite and you should be able to say an element which is in the set or not in the set you should be able to clearly distinguish whether an element belongs to a particular set or does not belong to a particular set. That is the definiteness. And the distinctness means the elements in the set should be distinct in the sense that we, we know that we, we won't allow repetition in a set. We will not write set 1, 1, 2, 2. These are the two fundamental requirements that Kander has given. And another one is that once we have these two fundamental requirements and how you form a set, and how you form it. There's a technique for forming a set should also be there. And how that technique can be done. Now, what why the the very reason that I have given these two things in bold is that uh, this definiteness and distinctness often uh, are two conditions which are often not met in real life situations, in the sense that the, for this definiteness may not be clear always. For example, uh, you can see that the set of all new cars or a uh, intelligent students, etc., that the definiteness is not there. That means we cannot clearly say that a car is new or not new. Therefore, the boundary is not clear. Now, in situations like the classical set theory fails to represent the situation clearly, that was the need for introducing fuzzy sets by study. Obviously, from the, from the very definition of Candor, if you relax that definiteness, obviously the things becomes not clear. And so that in such situation, uh, Zade introduced the fuzzy sets for representing the situation. And the second one is that if you relax the condition distinct, that means if you allow repetition in a set, that means usually it is not allowed. But in real life, you can see that this is quite possible to have a repetition. For example, the database of employees in a company uh, it's possible that the salaries of employees will have a duplicate entries. Ages of employees will have a duplicate entries. That means duplicate entries are quite natural in nature. That means if you dis relax that distinctness condition, there are many naturally occurring things. Now, how to represent that? That if you allow repetition also into sets, in fact, that will be called a structure called a multi-set. In fact, a set with repetitions is called a multiset. That's another, in fact, another generalization of the set. There are so many ones. Rough sets are there, soft sets are there, genuine sets are there, and many, many variations of all these things. Inducionistic fuzzy sets are there. In fact, L fuzzy sets are there. All these things, all variations are there. So for these are the candidates recommend I have given element are not identical are considered as distinct objects constituting a set, set should be definite so if you relax this you will get the other two structures and uh, objects should be definite and what do you mean by collection into a word that means that is a something called that is something called how to form a set 
how to find out the elements of the how to form a particular set that is meant by collection into a whole that is mentioned in the very definition of the candor i have mentioned earlier now this means an act of collecting elements to form a set and this is done mainly by the help of properties or predicates that means if an element has a particular property say px the element belongs to that set otherwise not thus if px is a predicate we form a set x px the set of all objects x which satisfy that condition therefore that is one of the that is how the candor uh, give away which is why sometimes called the in fact called the axiom one of the axiom the axiom of abstraction abstraction to form a set and uh, given any property p there exists a set y whose elements are just those entries x having the property p that is what is called the axiom of abstraction therefore why i am mentioning this axiom of abstraction is that it creates some problems therefore for example find the set 1 2 3 it can be represented as a set x where x is a natural number smaller than 4 this is how that uh, predicates are used the predicate is that x is a natural number less than 4 this is how the predicates are used for forming the set therefore there are some problems associated with this formation of sets by predicates the axiom of abstraction has some problems and obviously at the time of candor itself these problems were identified in fact you may be knowing a mathematician or rather a british philosopher called bertrand russell who discovered that intuitive notion of set proposed by candor led to some antinomies there is some contradictions in the nature and there are two kinds of remedy for this con this discontent how we propose and the one is called the axiomatization of candonian set theory and candor defined the set as a well defined collection of objects which are distinct and definite and uh, uh, those definition created so i will explain i, I will i will explain what is the problem of with that definition and to get out of that problem the axiomatic approach of set theory in fact currently it is known as isdfc the summer law triangle thoroff theory with the choice axiom that is the uh, latest in fact that is the accepted one uh, version of the uh, axiomatic approach of set theory now that is now with all these disputes settled that is the uh, fund form that is a fund of foundation of set theory nowadays now how we come to that what was the problems that was given in the definition of the candor that will that will see therefore this axiom of abstraction lead to many contradictions and the most important among are or interesting ones are russell's paradox candor paradox and burali forte paradox i will just skip through what are these things russell's paradox this is one of the versions of russell's paradox maybe for mathematicians the theoretic version will be of interesting for others other some other uh, version will be interesting i will give some other version also let us call a set normal if that it does not contain itself as a member that's quite natural for example like the set of squares that set is not itself a square and therefore it is not a member of the set of four squares so it is normal on the other hand if we take the complementary set of non squares that set itself is not a square and it so it, sh it should be one of its own members it is abnormal then abnormal set is a set where it that set contains itself as an element that is very clear there are two types of sets normal sets and abnormal sets now we consider the set of all normal sets call it as r give the name r for that and ask the question is r normal set is r a normal set then obviously you can have two answers yes or no and if it is normal if your answer is yes if it is normal then it is a member of r since r is a set of all normal sets and since r contains all normal sets but it is that in that case r contains itself as a member that means therefore that set is abnormal therefore if you see, if you give if you agree that r is normal and i can prove that r is abnormal similarly on the other hand if r is abnormal then it is a not a member of r since r contains only normal sets but if that is the case then r does not contain itself as a member and therefore is normal that means if you say that r is abnormal i can prove that it is normal that means this is a paradox clearly this is a paradox if we suppose r is normal we can prove it is abnormal if we suppose r is abnormal i can prove it is normal here hence r is neither normal nor abnormal which is a contradiction which is a contradiction therefore this is this contradiction occurs only because we are defining a set like this that means we are using a predicate 
like this for defining a set. Therefore, the whether it is acceptable or not. Therefore, definition or defining formation of sets via via some predicates, some properties associated, uh, may lead us to some contradictions like this. Therefore, this is another interesting example. This may not be for a mathematician. For a layman, there is a very interesting uh, paradox. It is named as the Barber Paradox. Goes like this. Suppose there is a town with just one male barber. And in this town, every man keeps himself clean shaven by doing exactly one of the things, obviously. One is shaving himself or going to the barber. There are only two possible. Either you shave yourself or go to the barber. Another way to say this is the barber shaves only those men in town who do not shave themselves. Perfectly okay. No problem. This is perfectly logical until we raise the paradoxical question. The question, my question is that who shaves the barber? Who shaves the barber? This question is a paradox because according to the statements above, he can either be shaven by himself or the barber, which happens to be himself. However, none of these possibilities are valid. That is because if the barber does shave himself, then the barber, which is himself, must not shave himself. If the barber does shave, does not shave himself, then barber, which is happens to be himself, must shave himself. That means this is a contradiction. If he tried to shave himself, he cannot shave. If he is not shaving himself, then he has to shave. Therefore, this is a paradox. That is what is equal, logically equivalent to the paradox, the set theoretic paradox I have given earlier. Therefore, these are some problems in the Candonian definition. Of, uh, rather than that, there, were, there is a power set paradox that is given by Cantor. It is there, and I am not going to the details of the another another paradox by Burali 40. And these are all problems that occurred in the Candonian definition of a set. And this is some bi some bibliographic details of Cantor. And his name was George Fernand Ludwig Philip Cantor. He lived from 1845 to 1918, and he born in Russia and died in Germany. And this is the details of Bedrand Arthur William Russell, and he belongs to UK. 1872 to 1970 lifespan. This is the details of the Italian mathematician Cesare Burali Forti. Therefore, this, owing to these problems which have uh, uh, happened in the Candonian definition, there are many alternatives suggested. And the important thing was the axiomatization of the set theory. Set will be defined as some object satisfying seven conditions. One, two, three, four, five, maybe 10, 11, you list down. And an object satisfying this will be called an axiom, uh, uh, called axioms of set, and the object satisfying that will be a set. That is one way, and it was mainly by Summerlow and Summerlow, Frankel and Thoraff, and uh, there was a dispute where choice axiom was there. The axiom has the property that they should be independent. Now the dispute was that well, that was the choice axiom is independent or not, and finally it was settled and choice axiom was also included, and now it is known as the ZFC, Summerlow, Frankel, Thoraff theory with the choice axiom. That is one of the alternatives. And other things are theory of types by Whitefield and Russell, and theory of classes by Newman are other alternatives suggested for Cantonian type of set theory. Anyway. This is one way I have discussed that is a problem, how we are going for alternative type of set theories and uh, how the problems are settled. And in fact, we are not going in that direction. Incidentally, I told regarding the development of set theory, we will come to our track. Now, one other problem associated is the vagueness, as I mentioned already. And uh, mathematicians require that everything should be exact, including the notion of a set. However, philosophers, recently computer scientists have become interested in vague concepts. For mathematician, exactness is a must, but others it need not be. Now, fuzzy set theory, vagueness is modeled by graduated membership, obviously, that you maybe saw that developed uh, the membership value concept and, the graduate, and it is uh, depicted as a graduated membership. And in rough set theory, maybe we will be concentrating on the, on the in later talks in this session, maybe in tomorrow and other days. Rough set theory expresses vagueness not by means of membership, but employing the boundary region of a set. 
And if the boundary region of the set is empty, it means that the set is crisp, otherwise the set is rough or in exact. etc. And non-empty boundary region of a set means that our knowledge about the set is not sufficient to define the set precisely. But that is what is the alternate, the, the suggestions for handling vagueness, the candidates for handling vagueness that is naturally occurring. Now, coming to soft computing. Now, what the concept of soft computing was initiated by Sade himself, the, maybe the person who introduced the fuzzy sets, himself introduced in 1981, uh, the concept of soft computing. And uh, in fact, this is one of the multidisciplinary systems obtained from the fusion of many fields. Obviously, the important among our fuzzy logic, obviously fuzzy logic is there. Neural co neurocomputing is there and the probabilistic reasoning. And there are many more other, but these are the three major constituents uh, from which this, uh, this particular concept was evolved. And uh, what is computing? Before saying what is soft computing, I should say what is computing. And if there is something called hard, hard computing, I should mention that also. Then only I should, uh, I should be able to say what is soft computing. The discipline of computing is the systematic study of algorithmic process that describe and transform information, their theory, analysis, design, efficiency, implementation, and application. All these things comes under computing. The fundamental question underlying is computing in underlying in computing is what can be efficiently automated? That is what is how how things can be automated. Therefore, that is one of the basic questions in soft com, in, in computing in general. And we will see how we will address all these things. Now, before going to soft computing, what we see, what is hard computing? Hard computing is the usual or the traditional way of computing the things. Hard computing, that is conventional computing, requires a precisely stated analytic model, analytical model, and often a lot of computation time. Therefore, these are the uh, two significant parameters associated with the hard computing. That means the problem should be stated uh, precisely, and there should be an analytical model, valid analytical model, and the computation time is much more. The computation time is much more for this one. And real world problems exist in non ideal environment. Therefore, this ideal environment is needed for hard, hard computing, but this ideal environment may not be possible in real life problems, problems of real life, or problems of environment, etc there will be non-ideal environment will be existing. Now for that is a, the premises and guiding principles of hard computing are precision, certainty and the rigor. Therefore many contemporary problems do not lend themselves to precise solutions such as obviously recognition problems, handwriting recognition, speech recognition, object recognition, image recognition, and mobile robot coordination, forecasting, combinatorial problems, etc. These problems are more or like, in fact, not at all precise. For example, if you have to identify a handwritten handwritten letter, alphabet A, if a person is writing in A, it can be written in many fashion. Therefore, we will be writing in a slanted way, we will be writing in a curly way, all, all possible writings are there. Therefore, it, there is no precise definition how to write a letter A. Therefore, even though it is written, whatever fashion or whatever model it is done, it should be understood. Therefore, that may not be possible in hard computing. Now, coming to what is soft computing. The soft computing differs from conventional or hard computing in that, unlike hard computing, it is tolerant of imprecision. The, what is the, the, the type of imprecision I have mentioned, the type of uncertainty, the partial truth and approximation, all these things is this particular thing should be tolerable. Therefore, this should try, should try to handle all these things. In effect, the role model for soft computing is the human mind. Therefore, the human can, mind can process many things at a time. In fact, if, if, a human, if, a, if a human is looking at an alphabet, if it is written in capital letters or small letters, curly way or standard way, whatever it is, the human eye and his brain will identify it as A in whatever fashion it is written. That the same type of uh, reasoning that of the human mind should be achieved. That is the that is the task that we need to achieve in soft computing. The final task that is a role model is nothing but the human mind itself in soft computing. 
as i mentioned that the principal constituents or tools or techniques are fuzzy logic neural networks support vector machines evolutionary computation machine learning and probabilistic reasoning these are the constituents and obviously you know as we in fact uh, we are focusing on fuzzy sets and uh, rough set the for fuzzy logic is mainly concerned with the imprecision and approximate reasoning that we know there are uh, basically we are dealing imprecision here and uh, imprecisions are there are of two types of imprecisions are there one is vagueness and other one is ambiguity and the vagueness was modeled by fuzzy sets by zade and others and ambiguity was modeled by fuzzy meshes by sujino and others in fact these are two 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 types of imprecision that very naturally occur in real life and uh, nature and that can be modeled using fuzzy sets as well as fuzzy measure in fact that is there and neuro computing with the learning and curve fitting and the probabilistic reasoning with the uncertainty and the belief propagation the for these are the these are the things that are concerned fuzzy logic is concerned with this one neuro computing is concerned with these ones learning and curve fitting and probabilistic reasoning with uncertainty and the belief propagation so for these are the three major constituents the motivation soft computing is the fusion of methodologies designed to model and enable solution to real world problems which are not modeled or too difficult to model mathematically that is the motivation the aim is that soft computing is to exploit the tolerance for imprecision uncertainty approximate reasoning and partial truth in order to achieve close resemblance with the human life that is the aim and there are many mathematical tools available for modeling complex systems nowadays such as the in fact the classical probability theory is there the fuzzy set theory is there interval mathematics is there but we know that there are inherent difficulties associated with the each of these techniques therefore probability theory is applicable only for a stochastically stable system that is a requirement if the system is not stochastically stable and the probabilistic reasoning is not at all valid interval mathematics is not sufficiently adaptable for problems with the different uncertainties and uh, obviously we know in fuzzy set theory the major disadvantage is the setting up of membership function value is always been a problem in fuzzy set theory it is there is a subjectivity comes into picture many of these problems therefore in fuzzy set theory uh, setting up the membership value is a problem there therefore these are the problem that in fact by mentioning that uh, if you take one among these Alone, obviously there are problems associated with that. Is that is a justification for going for a hybrid structure? The hybrid structure means the fusion of one or more technologies where you take the, uh, in fact, it will be fused in such a way that you take the advantages of both and the disadvantages of the both will be discarded without any problem. Anyway, that is the motivation for going hybrid structure. Therefore, these are the things. probability theory interval mathematics and fuzzy set theory and this is a definition of fuzzy sets given by zade in 1965 and we are all i think all are familiar with that concept therefore i may not uh, spend time on the definition of fuzzy set it's very fundamental it was introduced in 1965 by zade fuzzy set is nothing but a mapping from uh, the set x to universal set x to the closed interval 0 1 if the 0 1 is replaced by And that is the membership value set is replaced by a lattice obviously you get the l fuzzy set and there many variations are there intuitionistic fuzzy sets and so 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 many things are there anyway this is fuzzy sets this gives a general framework and other structures other than fuzzy sets what are the structures for modeling uncertainty and obviously uh, representing vagueness or ambiguity this one is the rough rough set by pollock in 1982 and we already mentioned that multi sets as i mentioned that was introduced that also was introduced by yager in 1986 he is contributed much and still very active in the field of fuzzy set theory uh, yager is the person who introduced the multi sets theory and soft sets by russian mathematician moldoso that was introduced in very recently in 1999 in fact i will try to give an application from fuzzy soft set at the end of this one and genuine set by Mustafa Demikre said Turkish mathematician these are other structures that were introduced and rough set theory was introduced by Pollock and based on in fact uh, it was in fact we can say that for mathematician this rough set is an embodiment of our own equivalence relation the equivalence relation and its gra- and granularity are the main theme that was used in rough set theory therefore here we will approximate an arbitrary subset of the universe 
by two definable or observable subsets called the lower and upper approximation. And uh, there will be, you will be having a universal set and a lower and upper approximation that will give some approximation to the set. It has been successfully applied to machine learning, intelligent systems, inductive reasoning, pattern recognition, and many other fields. Uh, coming to multi-sets, as I mentioned that a multi-set is a set where the repetition is allowed. Therefore, we'll find uh, many in the many real, uh, real situation I have already mentioned where this multi-sets comes into picture, where the duplicates are significant here. In such situations, the classical definition of a set proves inadequate for the situation presented. And multi-set is a collection of objects which repetition of element is significant. And uh, the formal definition of multi-set was given by Yager. It was a, in fact, uh, via a count function, the definition of multi-set was given. And subset is another structure initiated by the Russian researcher Molosov. He proposed subset as a completely generic mathematical tool for modeling uncertainties. There is no limited condition on the description of the object, so the researchers can choose the form of parameters they need, which greatly simplifies the decision-making process and make the process more efficient, especially in the presence of partial information. The traditional subset is a mapping. In fact, this mathematically it is a mapping from a set called a parameter set to, uh, to the crisp subset of the to the, in fact, the, the core domain will be the power set of a universe. That is, will be mapped to a crisp subset of the universe. Now, coming to hybridization, the significance of getting different soft technologies getting hybrid is that uh, it is difficult to satisfy the needs of a particular area or application with a single structure alone because owing to the limitations of the individual ones. In most of the real applications, these structures are needed to be merged together in a fruitful way to obtain the desired result. That is what I mentioned already. One or more of these structures will be hybridized so that uh, the resulting structure will be having the advantages of both. That is what we are trying to do in this hybridization. Now we know that, however, soft computing should not have limited to using fuzzy set, but should have the freedom to draw potential fusions produced by some of the extensions of fuzzy sets as well as rough sets, soft sets, multi sets, and possible hybridizations of these structures. Therefore, it should not be restricted to fuzzy sets alone. That that should be. Therefore, those after the introduction of fuzzy sets, so many structures with many variations are developed, and there are so many potential. Hybridize, hybridizations of these are possible and many variations of this fuzzy sets itself are there. Therefore, all these should be utilized for effective soft computing. That is the idea. Therefore, in fact, what we will be concentrating are fuzzy sets, rub sets, Uh, various combinations of these independent structures will be discussed uh, with a specific application to one among these. One specific application I will try to give, maybe in uh, fuzzy subsets application I will give. The fuzzy multisets. A multiset is a set with a repetition, and if you merge multisets and fuzzy sets, the structure that we are getting is a fuzzy multiset. As I mentioned, this is very important in the sense that. Uh, as I mentioned, this multi-set represents how many times an element is repeated. Therefore, that is something representing the quantum or the, the quantitative property associated with an object. And obviously, fuzzy sets represents the qualitative property. I told you already that uh, new car, intelligent students, etc. How to represent that? That will be represented in a scale varying from 0 to 1. If you get the membership value is 1, it is perfectly intelligent or perfectly new. If it is zero, it is perfectly not intelligent or perfectly old, whatever it is. That means fuzziness represents the qualitative properties of an object concerned and the multiset will represent the quantitative, how many are there, how much repetition is there. That means if you look into any object, basically any object will have these two quanti 
qualities. In fact, the quantitative as well as the qualitative properties. These two properties will be associated with each element. That is quantity and quality. These are that. If you have a structure which can represent both together, obviously that will be obtained by merging fuzzy sets and multi sets. You will get the fuzzy multi sets. That you will get a very very much powerful tool. And in fact, that is called the fuzzy multi sets. That is the significance on the rational behind going for such a hybridization. A fuzzy multi set is a multi set in which all the elements have a membership value. In fuzzy set, we have a membership value. In multi set, you have multiple entries. The multiple entries also are giving membership values. What you get is a fuzzy multi set. That is an example of a multi set. X is repeated here, maybe X is repeated one, two times with the membership values 0 0.2 and 0 0.3, and that can be represented like X with the values 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And usually, we will write uh, the membership value. Uh, along with the x and why with the y repeated thrice with the membership value 1.5 and 0.5 usually we will start with the largest value in the descending order we will write down the membership values that is a conventional way of writing that way the, the, it can be written any way in representing but for operations we'll write it in some particular way that is what is called a membership sequence with the x we will associate a membership sequence uh, uh, it is a decreasingly ordered sequence of the elements in count of AX. Therefore, therefore, we will be having, in fact, if this is there, we will represent it in the decreasing order. With the X, uh, I can write 0 0.3 and 0 0.2. With the Y, I will write 0 0.5, 0 0.5, sorry, 1.5, 0.5. That means uh, decreasingly ordered sequence I will associate with each element. And that will be called the count member. Therefore, with the, in fact, the fuzzy multiset will be uh, characterized by a count function from the set, uh, the underlying set X2, uh, this sequences, this membership sequences, where the elements are, uh, in fact, the elements in the membership sequence are coming from the closed interval 0, 1. That's how uh, that belongs to the membership values of the fuzzy set. And uh, we will define like that, and in the decreasingly order, we will assign the membership value with each element in the multi set. And uh, these are, and uh, once we have that, uh, will the length will be defined. Uh, the, the, the maximum j for mu a j x not equal to zero. That is the maximum. Maximum how many entries are there is there. And for operations, what you made is the length of every element will be made equal so that the operation is combustible. So that if you are arranging it in the decreasing order, at the end you can assign zeros as much needed so that you make the length of each element equal for further operations. Therefore, based on that, you can define the union and intersection for multi sets like this. Just like fuzzy set, you take the maximum value and the minimum value. And when you take the maximum value, obviously if a zero is there, the other will take. If you take the minimum one, zero will be taken for all that. That will that that is how the that is a significance of appending zeros at the end so that the length of each element is made equal for operation purposes. Union, intersection, etc. can be done like that. Anyway, that is uh, regarding Fuzzy multi set. I just want to mention the significance of that. That only. We are not interested in further operations. Obviously, we go for rough sets. The rough set is a concept based on quite generally by means of topological operators, interior and closure called approximation. You can see that uh, uh, those who are interested in topology, they can identify that uh, the lower and upper approximations in a rough set are nothing but the interior and the closure operators the, that we are familiar in topology. Therefore, let us describe this problem more precisely. Suppose we are given a set of objects U called a universe and a, an indiscernibility relation, which are as a subset of U cross U, representing our lack of knowledge about the elements of U. Now, what do you mean by an indiscernibility relation? An indiscernibility relation is nothing but in mathematically, for mathematicians, we can say it is an, it is an equivalence relation. Otherwise, it represents our lack of information about a particular element. That how you re represent, in fact, you can represent the, your information, uh, how you represent your lack of information, how you represent your lack of information about an element. That is being done by this indiscernible relation. Now, I will try to explain, I will try to explain uh, by, what do you mean by lack of, lack of knowledge? What is the meaning of that? For example, for example, you consider a patient coming to a doctor for diagnosing. The doctor may be asking him many questions. 
to identify what is the this particular patient's uh, disease etc and he may be asking whether you are having headache whether you are having body body pain uh, whether what is your temperature body temperature etc and he observe all these things if two patients are coming to a doctor if both exhibit the same conditions both are having fever both are having body fever both are having body pain and both are having headache obviously they are both are having very high temperature that means the patient may not be a, the, the, the doctor may be may not be able to distinguish between these two persons for a for a doctor what is important parameter is that these things are important parameters and his name may not be important for the doctor but based on name you can distinguish these two but if you look at the parameters which are relevant in diagnosing uh ah, the doctor cannot distinguish between these two since both are exhibiting the same symptoms that means for a doctor it is a lack of information about these two patients therefore for the doctor these two are for the doctor these two are indiscernible if the doctor cannot distinguish one from other that is how the, the doctor defines them the doctor is defining an equivalent relation there they are defining a patient is related to another patient if both exhibit same symptoms for do for a doctor you can see that that's an equivalent relation a patient is having the same symptom as himself a a and b having same symptom b and a having the same symptom a b have same symptom and b and c are having the same symptom obviously a and c also have. that means the knowingly or unknowingly doctor defined an equivalent relation and then what he is doing for the doctor all these patients are same those who exhibit same thing that means doctor will catch hold of all these patients and he will put it in an equivalent class that's in the equivalent class uh, many will be there all are having the same symptom that is what we are doing that is how that is why i told you this rough set is an embodiment of equivalent relation for mathematicians and this is what is the basic concepts are lower approximation upper approximation boundary region etc and this is how we are having we have a universal set here and uh, a, a based on an arbitrary based on an equivalent relation or an indiscernibility relation that is given in the definition of rough set obviously there is a partition will be there that is this will be that small grids you can see that will be the partitions or or maybe for uh, uh, people working in knowledge discovery and information set they will be calling us granules of knowledge the for, for a doctor this is a granule of knowledge all those ex, all those patients exhibiting the similar symptom is a granule of knowledge therefore this will give you a granule of knowledge that means mathematically mathematicians it is nothing but the partition of the universe and if i want to represent this at x it's an oval shaped an egg shaped thing is there that is why my x and you can see that this x is a particular a particular disease set of all patients having a particular disease and based on the symptom you can see that there are some equivalent classes which are coming entirely within the for this shaded region entirely within that uh, that set x uh, that will give you the lower approximation and there are some portion which have a non empty intersection with uh, this oval shaped set region and that will give you the upper approximation this this is the upper approximation and uh, in fact this will be the lower approximation and the boundary will be the uh, difference of these two will be the boundary region therefore we have the lower approximation upper approximation the set and the boundary will be the difference of these two so this is how mathematically what is a rough set you have a equivalent relation based on that you divide it into different classes and then see what is the lower approximation as well as the upper approximation and the set is crisp if the boundary is empty and it is exact if the boundary is non empty therefore there are in fact as i mentioned that uh, there are two or oh, generalizations of this is also in fact two hybridizations of rough set theory is also possible one is called the fuzzy rough set in fact the definition of a fuzzy rough set is given here and this is done using a in fact an indiscernibility relation we are using there and for defining fuzzy rough set we are using a relation called a fuzzy relation and a fuzzy relation which is reflexive symmetric and transitive will be used for defining fuzzy rough sets and it was introduced by duban rade and the definition of that is given here in fact uh, due to the shortage of time i may not go in detail to the definition the merge fuzzy rubs fuzzy sets and rubs set two 
structures is are possible one is fuzzy rough set the definition goes like this and another one is here also we have upper approximation lower another one is rough fuzzy set another type of combination here the universe is an initial universe u will be there and you have a relation instead of fuzzy relation here will be having an arbitrary relation r Uh, maybe an, uh, an equivalence relation or indiscriminate relation R will be there, a relation will be there. It is not the fuzzy relation, it is an ordinary relation. Based on that, you can define a rough fuzzy sets also. Two different types of combinations of rough sets and fuzzy set. The details are given here. Yes. Now, coming to the uh, part soft set, this is a uh, this is what I want to concentrate. In fact, it is the Uh, very recently evolved uh, concept uh, by Molotso in 1999 and here u is an initial universe and uh, you will be having two sets one is u and other one is set of parameters parameters means of basically it can be anything but this may be basically that will be the properties associated with uh, the elements in the universe and p means pu means the power set and uh, a subset is usually denoted by a pair of a uh, where f is a mapping from the attribute set a to the power set of the universal set from a to power set of u that is a subset by that is the definition given by molosso and in other words the subset is a parameterized family of subset of the universe u we can represent for every epsilon in a f epsilon represents a subset of the a uh, universal set that is called epsilon approximate element of the set f clearly a subset is not a set and this is an example you take the universal set as a set of houses under consideration and e is the parameter set obviously some parameters or some properties associated with uh, this uh, houses house can be expensive beautiful wooden cheap green surrounding etc that is e1 e2 etc e5 and let there be 10 houses h1 to h10 and consider the subset fe a subset fe can represent the attractiveness of the house by pointing out in fact this will point out f of e1 will point out what are the some persons expecting expensiveness may be an attraction beautiful may be an attraction wooden may be an attraction cheap may be an attraction for some other people this will represent this will point out what are houses expensive f of e1 i know i told it f is a mapping from a to power set of u f of e1 will point out those houses which are expensive say h to h4 similarly f of ei points out all expensive houses in you and similarly e2 will point out beautiful houses similarly each will point out a house the uh, each will point out houses having a, that particular property in fact uh, uh, for storing these things obviously these are some for uh, that means this is a parameterized collection fei i varying from 1 2 3 4 5 if you have a collection fe1 fe2 is a parameterized collection ei is the parameter taking the values i equal to 1 2 3 etc 5 Now for this has two parts: the predicate part and the approximate value set. The which has two parts: predicates, that is the values of the say, elements in the set A, and uh, with each predicate there is associated a crisp subset, what is called the approximate. That is what is called the approximate value set. It is there. Now this is how we represent in a table. We are storing these things in computer, etc. The table representation is needed. The table representation along row. we have the properties e1 e2 and along column first column will be having houses h1 h3 x6 here there and i enter here is if h1 has a particular property e1 then you will enter one here if h1 doesn't have the property e1 you enter zero that is i get enter is tij which is one if h i belongs to f of ej and zero otherwise now this this one signifies that uh, the significance of this entry this element one is that uh, the significance of this element one is that uh Yet the house H4 is having the property E4. The house H4 is having the property E4, and this means that the house H6 is not having the property E5. Therefore, this is how we can represent it in a table. And uh, operations on once we define a structure, it is quite natural go for the operations there, and we can define subset, superset, equality, not set, complement, etc. Are there? In fact, a complement is defined by F complement not A. Not A is the negation set of the parameter set, and uh, the complement of the subset is defined by another set F complement, which is defined from negation A to power set of A. It is defined as F complement of alpha is U minus F of not I alpha, where for all alpha belongs to not A. This is how it is defined. These are some properties associated with the negation. 
not set of not set of a is there not a union b is not a union not b not a intersection b is not a intersection not b etc and the, if you take it it is involutive take it twice you get the whole thing f a complement complement is f a that's a usual property associated with the complement that is to be satisfied now this is how the definition of subset f a and g b are subset if uh, a subset of b and for all elements epsilon in a f epsilon and g f epsilon sorry f epsilon and g epsilon are same identical approximation this is a definition for subset and they can define or operation here f a or and and operation f a and g b this is again a subset which is defined on a cross b this is h a cross b so for this h is a function from a cross b to the power set of u where h of alpha beta is given as h alpha intersection g beta h alpha is a, is a power set in a is an element in power set of a and a g beta is an element in the power set of b and you take intersection of those two what do you get is in fact that is h alpha beta and similarly uh, union o a cross b it is defined sorry or function o a cross b uh, there instead of intersection you take the union what you are getting is the uh, or operation now if you have two subsets we have these two operations are there obviously the de morgan laws are holding for this or and operations or and and operations as well as the complement i have defined in the previous slide the de morgan type of laws will be holding for this and the union operation can be defined f a and g b are two subsets is the union is defined as h c where c is a union b here and uh, the function is defined like this h is a mapping from c to power set of u where h equal to f e if e belongs to a minus b g if e belongs to b minus a and the union if it belongs to the intersection here you can see that for this union operation obviously the the parameter set is the union of the original sets now it can be varied you can extend it for in fact we can extend it for the intersection also but what happens if you take the parameter set as a intersection b and h is defined as f e union g if e belongs to this parameter set c in that case it will be called a restricted union operation and in a similar fashion you can define the extended intersection operation also we have the the original union and intersections are there and rather we can restrict the union and they extend the intersection also those type of operations are also possible so for that is the extended intersection operation is given like this here therefore this is the intersection operator where the set to c the parameter set to c is the intersection of the given ones so there are some type of identities are holding here in fact you can notice that the de morgan type of identities may not be holding for union intersection and all types of complement now we have a combination of many complements and many types of unions and intersections are there and for not all de morgan laws will be holding but for some of them some pairs of them this only this de morgan law will be holding yeah i may not be going that because this is not of uh what talk now this is a theoretical problem a theoretical question i may not be going and fuzzy subset in fact that is a fusion of fuzzy sets and the subsets will be there and uh, in fact what you are having this is nothing but a mapping from this fa is the fuzzy subset of it's a mapping from the parameter set to set of all fuzzy subsets of u in the in the ordinary set it is the set of all subsets of u rather than that you consider a set of all fuzzy subsets of u then you get a fuzzy subset and the operations of that can be defined uh, by making use of the operations in fuzzy set theory now i say that uh, fa and gb are common universe then fa is a fuzzy soft subset of gb if a subset of b and for all e in a fe is a fuzzy subset of g and then we'll say that fa is a fuzzy soft subset of gb that means by extending the operations in fuzzy sets and this offset we can define operations for fuzzy subsets fa and gb can be defined like this fa and gb is h a cross b where the membership value h a b is given by fa intersection gb for all a in a and for all b in b where the intersection means the fuzzy intersection of two fuzzy sets of in fact we know that this fa as well as gb are fuzzy subsets therefore you can go for the intersection of these two fuzzy sets the for the minimum value that is the infimum value in fact that, that will be used for defining the intersection here and similarly you can define the similarly you can define uh, 
uh, and and or operation can be defined here like this. All operations can be extended. Now coming to uh, the last part of that, I told you that I will tell something regarding a decision making problem. Uh, decision making problems are uh, in fact one of the major applications of these offsets as well as fuzzy sets and other structures are in decision making problems. And uh, I will try to explain one problem before that we will see what is a comparison table. It's a square table in which the number of rows and number of columns are equal. Rows and columns both are labeled by the objects O1 to ON of the universe and the entries are CIJ. That is rows and columns are labeled, are labeled by O1 etc ON and the entries in the table are CIJ. That is C11, C12 etc. But CIJ is a number of parameters for which the membership value of OI exceeds or equal to the membership value of OJ. That is how the CIJs are being filled up. And clearly this lies between 0 and k and we know that the CII that is uh, the, the diagonal entries are uh, is nothing but k where k is the number of parameters present in the first set. This is how the comparison table is being prepared and uh, we will find out the column sum and uh, OJ and uh, we, the column sum of an object OJ is denoted by TJ and it is defined as tj equal to summation cij where i from 1 to n. Likewise, the row sum rj can also be, we, we will compute the row sum as well as the column sum. The integer tj indicates the total number of parameters in which oj is dominated by all the members of u. That is the significance of the entry tj. And we will define a score, based on that score only we are going to take a decision. We define the score of an object. The score of an object ISI is defined as the difference of RI and TJ. This is how the score is being defined. And uh, the problem is to choose an object from the set of given objects with respect to a set of choice parameters. Therefore, we have a given set given set of objects are there and there are many parameters associated with each or each of these objects and a uh, decision maker has uh, some choice parameters that will be a subset of the set of all parameters based on these choice parameters the decision maker want to take uh, the most suited object or he want to go for an optimal one that is of his interest most suited one for him that an algorithm can be identification of an object for the identification object based on multi observer input data characterized by various attributes may be given as follows. An algorithm for this problem is given here. And this is the algorithm. You input the fuzzy subset. Obviously, the fuzzy subset can be represented in the tabular form. Uh, instead of giving 0 and 1 in the original fuzzy set case, here you can give any value between 0 and 1 as the table entries that will give the membership values. If you input fuzzy subset FA and GB, FA, GB and HC, input the parameter set P as observed by the observer. Therefore, parameter set P, you input it. Compute the corresponding resultant fuzzy subset SP. In fact, uh, you apply some aggregation operation or something, and you find out a corresponding resultant subset SP, and that also will be placed in the tabular form. And then construct a comparison table for that fuzzy subset SP. And then compute row sums and column sums, RI and TJ for each I. Then compute the score. Then compute the score. And you take the decision as SK. If SK is the, if K is the, uh, the the maximum value is obtained for the score corresponding to object k. If k has a more than one value, then any one of ok may be among ok can be chosen. Therefore, that is the algorithm. Now, based on this algorithm, that will be the, uh, the decision maker's final choice. This will be the decision maker's final choice. Now, that is the algorithm. And uh, coming to an uh, illustrative example, and that is the final part of that. I may be, in fact, I hope I can wind up in five minutes. I will wind up. That is the illustrative example I have given that you have a, a universal set U, the set of objects having different colors, sizes, and surface textures. 
the feather are objects are characterized by these three parameters color size and uh, surface texture that the parameter e may be e can be the color can be blackish it can be dark brown yellowish reddish and also the other ones so it can be uh, size can be large small very small average very large obviously surface can be coarse moderately coarse fine extra fine etc these are the parameters associated with the color size and surface structure so that will form uh, the parameter set of this subset let a b c denote three subsets of the set of parameters e so for a b c are some subsets of the parameters a represent in fact the color with reference to color that is what i have mentioned earlier already and b represents the size of the object uh, large very large object and c represents the surface structure and fine extra fine etc and uh, based on that a fuzzy subset fa describing the color space can be constructed like this this is what is the meaning of that the object o1 has a membership value 0.3 in a1 means the for o1 in fact the, here the maximum membership value comes for 0.9 that means uh, o6 is the maximum blackish among all the objects o6 is the most blackish one and uh, 0.3 o1 is the least blackish one that means what well, this is the membership value of each object o i in the set blackish the fuzzy set blackish entries similarly dark brown membership values can be given here yellowish the membership values for the set of yellowish color for the objects will be given here and the reddish is given here that means this fa describes the color space and similarly you can describe the object size are large very large etc here the membership value 0.9 coming here means and uh, the largest among this one is o4 the for o4 goes to the set of large with the membership value 0.9 here the membership value 0.2 means o5 is a smaller object and here you can see that uh, in small it is having value 0.9 the membership value is 0.9 it is coming here the for this is here the subset fuzzy subset gb uh, describing the object size then coming to texture feature also can be represented as hc with the membership values like this just like there therefore we have three subsets f fa gb and hc now and i consider the above two f consider fa and gb and if you perform the and operations for that the and operation performed for fa and gb obviously and the and operation is performed in a cross b and uh, a contains four element and b contains five element naturally a cross b contains four into five 20 elements that means there will be 20 parameters will be there and that will be represented by eij eij means ai and bj ai and bj obviously i varying from one to four and j varying from one to five 20 parameters will be there and if you require the fuzzy subset for the parameters in fact, we may not be interested in all 20 parameters. We may be interested in maybe some selected parameters, this one. Some of these selected parameters only we may be interested. Therefore, you take it as R. Then you take the resultant subset KR can be obtained like this. From that, in the membership value, it is a minimum of A and AJ will be given. That means the resultant subset KR will be there. There we are interested in E11, E15, etc. These parameters only. And uh, the values are there e11 value is that a1 and b1 the minimum of a1 and b1 that will be taken here the minimum of a1 and b1 the membership values in fa and gb you take the corresponding ones and take the minimum and fill up this table this is how this resultant subset is being obtained now let us now see how the algorithm may be used to solve this original problem consider the fuzzy subsets FA, GB, and the HC as defined above. And suppose the your P, there's a parameter choice parameter. The decision maker is interested in E11 and C1, E15 and C3, E12 and C2, E24 and C4. This is the this is the in the final choice. These are the parameters that decision maker is interested. He is interested in A1 and B1 and C1, whatever it is. Uh, and uh, a combination of that he want uh, the these three properties for that 
So, but this is the uh, this is the choice parameters. In fact, for that, obviously, tabular representation of the final subset, resultant subset SP can be written here. Here you have uh, obviously the FC. We have a value corresponding to O1, and in the earlier cross product, there is an E11 value. Take the minimum of those two and write it here. Therefore, this will be the resultant fuzzy subset SP corresponding to the parameter set P given like this, the parameter set P given like this. Uh, this is what is the choice parameter associated with the, in fact, the, the interest of the decision maker. Here, this is the final resultant fuzzy subset table. Now you apply the algorithm here. And the the comparison table is prepared here. Here you can, here you can see that in uh, the comparison table is prepared here, and uh, as we mentioned in the one. And then what you do is that you find out the row sum and column sum corresponding to each of the six objects O1 to O6. It is come. It is prepared, and uh, uh, find out the score function. And in the score, you identify, go for the largest one. The largest one is obviously, the largest one is this one. Eight is there. And eight corresponds to, and you can see that this eight corresponds to, obviously, O5. Eight corresponds to O5. The score is eight, and that corresponds to O5. That means the, the decision maker's final decision is to go for object five, based on his choice parameters. So that is the decision. This is how we have applied it. Uh, that uh, comes to the conclusion of my session. In fact, what I have tried, what I was trying to do is that uh, I started with the uh, very first definition of set given by Kander, and there are some problems associated with that. How how we rectified that, and how the problem of vagueness and uncertainty was handled and uh, uh, how what are the techniques used the fuzzy sets etc and what is the use for going for a hybrid structure rather than using a single structure and how this is significant in the context of soft computing and that also we discussed and finally we started with a specific application that this specific application is a very simple example it cannot be we can't say it as an application it's just an illustrative example how this concept can be applied and uh, uh, there are some references are also there. There are some references are also there. You can see. And in particular, particularly why I chose this particular uh, example is that uh, primarily now my interest is in subsets. So primarily interest is in subset and uh, some works are being done over here. And uh, this is a newly emerging field with uh, quite a lot promising applications are there. And uh, if, if you want to know more about that, you can obviously you can refer to these sets. And there is one book that is coming up by Springer. I can just show you the title of that book to you. And uh, this is the uh, title of the book. Uh, it is coming in Studiness in Studies in Fuzziness and Soft Computing. And that is. Uh, this is a monograph written by me and this will be available in Springer shop by November or December of this one. And this will be the this is the first book that will be coming in this particular area of subset covering all fundamentals and with some some application with some with some very few applications and uh, obviously a lot of amount of work is dedicated to the theory of subset. This will be the first book on on subsets which is which is going to be uh, published by Springer. Uh, in maybe I hope that it will come in this month, this year itself, it will be published. Okay, if you have any queries, etc., you may ask. I think I should stop sharing. Thank you, professors, for your nice presentation and talk on such an interesting topic. Yeah. Now, this session is open for query from audience. Hello. Yes, if an audience have some queries, then ask now. OK, sir, uh, we'll have query from live sessions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from uh, Bhavita. 
he wants yes. the he wants to know about latest finding hybrid model in soft sets uh, there are in, in hybrid models in soft set as i mentioned that the soft set is nowadays clubbed with uh, almost all the concept i have uh, defined it is uh, clubbed with uh, fuzzy sets are there or rough sets are uh, there it is clubbed with the multi sets are there and uh, very recently there are some extensions of uh, fuzzy sets are there in fact uh, uh, pythagorean type of fuzzy sets are there uh, what we say fermatian type fuzzy sets are there complex fuzzy sets are there and uh, the merger of these with uh, soft sets is a promising field and obviously spherical fuzzy sets are also there all these things are uh, promising areas and not not only to fuzzy sets Uh, there are works uh, hybridizations of soft set with the multi sets are available and uh, other structures are also uh, rough sets are also there a uh, rough soft sets and soft rough sets are there and that is also an area there are so many areas there is the work is uh, flourishing in this area like anything there are so many applications are available yeah many, many hybridizations <coughs> okay sir and uh, one questions from kashur amal Uh, you want to know about uh, how qualitative information system are proceed in soft sets soft sets in fact uh, the problem is that in one of in, my, in uh, the problem that we usually encounter is that uh, a phenomena is obviously uh, most of the real life phenomena are continuous in nature and for representing that we need to discretize it we need to discretize it and in fact that is quite often difficult and this is in fact that is that can be uh, done very smoothly in soft sets that is via uh, in fact the quality will be represented via the parameter set or the attribute set that we are doing here and there is no restriction there is no restriction for there is no restriction for how you define the parameter the parameter set can be anything in you know, that that's up to the decision maker you decide what is your parameter it can be a number it can be a property or it can be anything so that uh, that should be a property only it should be a property associated the only restriction is that it should be a property associated with the object that you are looking it can be anything now for that is advantage of representing qualitative properties here in fact the discretization process is done very smoothly here that is one of the advantages Yes, Doctor Vina Gautam, you can now ask question or query. Uh, thank you, yes, sir. So my question is that we, we are using multi-set or fuzzy multi-set yeah. or some other type of hybrid sets. So yeah. we are using fuzzy multi-set with the uh, membership value in the estimated lattice. Yeah, so yeah. What will the physical interpretation uh, physical interpretation of this? Uh, Uh, fuzzy multi-set with residuated lattice in real world. Fuzzy multi-set with the uh, residuated lattice. Residuated lattices. In fact, in fact, it is a fuzzy multi-set. Obviously, I told you that in fuzzy set theory, uh, there are many, many, many. many yeah. There are many, there are many extensions of fuzzy sets are there. Obviously, one of them is that the. Uh, Uh, when the instead of having the membership value in zero of one, you replace it by in fact what we need is some comparison only on the right side. I want to compare uh, what is in fact membership value one means it's perfectly okay and zero means well, not at all perfect. That is only I need some comparison. It is not always necessary that you should compare it over zero of one. You can compare it over any uh, any partially ordered set, in particular any lattice. With the with an order of any set with an order different on that the the, the use of zero one is in the context it is quite natural and it is very down to earth and it is very application is very there it is dense there are so many properties associated with the closed interval zero one that is why you are using zero one rather than instead you can extend it to any anything obviously that extension once you extend the fuzzy set to that context it to a Whether a, whether instead of zero one you use a lattice or a complete lattice or a complete distributive lattice or a heating algebra or a boolean or whatever ever it is, then obviously you can club it with the multi sets and the corresponding uh, hybrid structure will be there. In fact, uh, not much so much mark is going in that direction because there is an inherent problem associated with the multi sets. The inherent problem in multi set is that we cannot distinguish objects. the the yeah. moment you start to distinguish objects 
it becomes a set. The, then the problem is that how you define the basic operations like a function, how will you define a function? A function is nothing but an association rule. Therefore, if you have an element here, then you associate with a unique element there, then that function works. If you have multiple copies or clones of things happening on left and right, how will you associate? That is a major problem. That is one of the major problem we have encountered while doing, in fact, one of my students has done some work in multiset theory. That is one problem we have encountered there. And we try to solve it and somehow we get out of that. Therefore, this type of problems will be wherever you go, this type of problem of uh, uh, clones or multiple elements without distinguishing each other will be there. That is a problem. That obviously that is why we are uh, appending zeros. We are for defining any operation. So we can we can restrict our membership value in some other type of lattices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is also it is possible. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, sir. One yes, question, one query from Dr. Srinivasa L. Chakravarti is: What yeah. are the application of soft sets? Now, basically, this soft set. I told you that this soft set is only an emerging area. Obviously, uh, the applications are major application. One is in decision making problems are there, optimization problems are there. And the uh, other thing is that uh, game theory, there is uh, application is there. Uh, soft games are introduced. Uh, and uh, other than that, uh, soft matrices are there, but that can also can be done. And uh, parameter reduction, maybe in RubSec, there is a concept of parameter reduction is there and how to get the core and reduct, etc. That's that thing in a, in a parallel manner. You can do that also. Parameter reduction is uh, obviously that is of quite importance here that you get a, from a very large, very huge parameter set. Uh, what are the significant one who without losing information, how to reduce it? That's a problem in parameter reduction there that can be used. And uh, there are uh, applications in uh, obviously financial diagnosis problems are there obviously uh, medical diagnosis problems are that medical diagnosis it obviously some uh, some applications are there but i don't know whether it will be applicable or not there are some possible examples are there for uh, to develop it to an application level more work need to be done especially in medical problem uh, based on financial diagnosis problems these are the possible applications and uh, in fact there are some of these applications are mentioned in my by the book i have mentioned in the last chapter is Entirely given for this application. Some applications are mentioned there. Okay, sir. So last queries is from yeah. uh, Palas Datta. Uh, yeah. Is uh, what is the what is the motivation of all hybridization of all these theories within the same framework? Well, the hybridization, as I mentioned, the the, the rationale behind hybridization is that. Uh, as I mentioned that in the fussy multi case, fussy multi set case, I have already mentioned. If you want to represent quantity and quality together. Obviously, the structure that we need is a structure that supports a database based on set may not support this. A database based on multi set only may not support that. If you if you have a data structure based on fuzzy multi set, obviously the quantitative properties as well as the qualitative properties can be supported. That is one example. And rather than the essence of hybridization is that. Uh, in real life applications, uh, representing the nature of the requirements by a single structure, whether it is a fuzzy set or a soft set or a rough set, may not be, may not be, may not be, we cannot uh, clearly represent it. This may not be of your demand that you may need to represent something more. In that case, you hybrid this together in a sense that you take the advantages of both and try to eliminate the disadvantages of both. The hybridization should be done in, in that fashion. That depends on the context in which you are doing. Maybe a domain expert may be needed and what are the things to be taken and what are to be excluded. And based on that, you select uh, this among these structures and club them together and get it down. That's all. Okay. Okay, sir. Sir, last, course, last query is, is uh, uh, any application of soft chain in multi-criteria decision making? Yes, it is there. I have seen some work in that in my multi-criteria decision making is also there. It is already available in literature. And anyway, you can search in that in net. It is available, I think. OK, sir. Thank you once again <laughs> and for uh, taking time from uh, your VG schedule and delivering uh, lectures in this workshop. So dear particip participants, uh, it's all for today. Let us meet tomorrow at the dual time.
thank, thank you, you dr mahesh for inviting me and i am i am thankful to all the organizers and the institute for giving me an opportunity in this august forum and presenting my findings here and i hope that uh, the participants interested ones can contact me in person also if they want anything uh, they want to know anything more in any of this area they can contact me in email also and i am much thankful to all of you and thank you for patient listening thank you all thank you professors thank you okay so it's all for today let us meet tomorrow at the scheduled time thank you all thank you all okay, bye bye everyone thank you